I'm Laura Sargent, and I'm reading from the picture of Dorian Gray. How sad it is, murmured Dorian Gray, with his eyes still fixed upon his own portrait. How sad it is! I shall grow old and horrid and dreadful, but this picture will always remain young. It will never be older than this particular day of June. If it was only the other way, if it was I who were always to be young, and the picture that were to grow old. For this, for this, I would give everything. Yes, there is nothing in the whole world I would not give. You would hardly care for that arrangement, Basil, cried Lord Henry, laughing. It would be rather hard lines on you. I should object very strongly, Harry. Dorian Gray turned and looked at him. I believe you would, Basil. You like your art better than your friends. I am no more to you than a green bronze figure, hardly as much, I would dare say. Hallward stared in amazement. It was so unlike Dorian to speak like that. What had happened? He seemed almost angry. His face was flushed and his cheeks burning. Yes, he continued, I am less to you than your ivory herms or your silver fawn. You will like them always. How long will you like me? Till I have my first wrinkle, I suppose. I know now that when one loses one's good looks, whatever they may be, one loses everything. Your picture has taught me that. Lord Henry is perfectly right. Youth is the only thing worth having. When I find that I am growing old, I will kill myself. Hallward turned pale and caught his hand. Dorian, Dorian, he cried. Don't talk like that. I have never had such a friend as you and I shall never have such another. You are not jealous of material things, are you? I am jealous of everything whose beauty does not die. I am jealous of the portrait you have painted of me. Why should I keep what I must lose? Every moment that passes takes something from me and gives something to it. Oh, if it were only the other way, if the picture could change and I could always be what I am now, why did you paint it? It will mock me someday, mock me horribly. The hot tears welled into his eyes. He tore his hand away, flinging himself on the divan. He buried his face in the cushions as if he was praying. This is your doing, Harry, said Hallward bitterly. My doing? Yes, yours, and you know it. Lord Henry shrugged his shoulders. It was the real Dorian Gray, that is all, he answered. It is not. If it is not, what have I to do with it? You should have gone away when I asked you. I stayed when you asked me. Harry, I can't quarrel with my two best friends at once, but between you both, you have made me hate the finest piece of work I have ever done, and I will destroy it. What is it but canvas and color? I will not let it come across our three lives and mar them. Dorian Gray lifted his golden head from the pillow and looked at him with a pallid face and tear-stained eyes as he walked over to the deal painting table that was set beneath the large curtained window. What was he doing there? His fingers were straying about among the litter of tin tubes and dry brushes, seeking for something. Yes, it was the long palette knife with its thin blade of, of lithe steel. He had found it at last. He was going to rip up the canvas. With a stifled sob, he leaped from the couch and rushing over to Howard, tore the knife out of his hand and flung it to the end of the studio. Don't, Basil, don't, he cried. It would be murder. I'm glad you appreciate my work at last, Dorian, said Hallward coldly, when he had recovered from his surprise. I never thought you would. Appreciate it? I am in love with it, Basil. It is part of myself. I feel that. Well, soon as you are dry, you shall be vanished, varnished and framed and sent home. Then you can do what you like with yourself. And he walked across the room and rang the bell for tea. You will have tea, of course, Dorian. And so will you, Harry. Tea is the only simple pleasure left to us. I don't like simple pleasures, said Lord Henry, and I don't like scenes except for on the stage. What absurd fellows you are, both of you. I wonder who it is who defined man as a rational animal. It was the most premature definition ever given. Man is many things, but he is not rational. I'm glad he is not, after all though I wish you chaps would not squabble over the picture. You had better let me leave it, Basil. This silly boy doesn't really want it, and I do. If you let anyone have it but me, Basil, I will never forgive you, cried Dorian Gray. 
and I don't allow people to call me a silly boy. You know the picture is yours, Dorian. I gave it to you before it existed. And you know I have been a little silly, Mr. Gray. You know you have been a little silly, Mr. Gray, and that you don't really mind being called a boy. I should have minded very much this morning, Lord Henry. Ah, this morning, you have lived since then. There came a knock to the door, and the butler entered with the tea tray and set it down upon the small Japanese table. There was a rattle of cups and saucers and the hissing of a fluted Georgian urn. Two globe-shaped china dishes were brought in by a page. Dorian Gray went over and poured the tea out. The two men sauntered languidly to the table and examined what was under the covers. Let us go to the theater tonight, said Lord Henry. There is sure to be something on somewhere. I have promised to dine at White's, but it is only with an old friend, so I can send him a wire and say that I am ill or that I am prevented from coming in consequence of a subsequent engagement. I think it would be rather a nice excuse. It would have the surprise of candor. It is such a bore putting on one's dress clothes, muttered Howard, and when one has them on, they are so horrid. Yes, answered Lord Henry dreamily. The costume of our day is detestable. It is so somber, so depressing. Sin is the only color element left in modern life. You really must not say such things like that before Dorian, Harry. Before which Dorian? The one who is pouring out tea for us or the one in the picture? Before either. I should like to come to the theater with you, Lord Henry, said the lad. Then you shall come, and you shall come too, Basil, won't you? I can't, really. I would sooner not. I have a lot of work to do. Well, then you and I will go alone, Mr. Gray. I should like that awfully. Basil Howard bit his lip and walked over, cup in hand, to the picture. I will stay with the real Dorian, he said sadly. Is it the real Dorian, cried the original of the portrait, running across to him? Am I really like that? Yes, you are just like that. How wonderful, Basil. At least you are like it in appearance. But it will never alter, said Howard. That is something. What a fuss people make about fidelity, murmured Lord Henry. And after all, it is purely a question for physiology. It has nothing to do with our own will. It is either an unfortunate accident or an unpleasant result of temperament. Young men want to be faithful and are not. Old men want to be faithless and cannot. That is all one can say. Don't go to the theater tonight, Dorian, said Howard. Stop and dine with me. I can't really. Why? Because I have promised Lord Henry to go with him. He won't like you better for keeping your promises. He always breaks them. I beg you not to go. Dorian Gray laughed and shook, to, shook his head. I entreat you. The lad hesitated and looked over at Lord Henry, who was watching them from the tea table with an amused smile. I must go, Basil, he answered. Very well, said Howard, and he walked over and laid his cup down upon the tray. It is rather late, and as you have to dress, you had better lose no time. Goodbye, Harry. Goodbye, Dorian. Come and see me soon. Come tomorrow. Certainly. You won't forget? No, of course not. And Harry. Yes, Basil. I remember what, remember what I asked you when in the garden this morning. I have forgotten it. I trust you. I wish I could trust myself, said Lord Henry, laughing. Come, Mr. Gray, my handsome is outside, and I can drop you at your own place. Goodbye, Basil. It has been a most interesting afternoon. As the door closed behind them, Howard flung himself down on a sofa, and a look of pain came across his face. One afternoon, a month later, Dorian Gray was reclining in a luxurious armchair in the library of Lord Henry's house on Curzon Street. It was, in its way, a very charming room with his high paneling wainscoting of lives, wainscoting of olive stained oak, its cream colored frieze and ceiling of raised plaster work and its brick dust felt carpet strewn with long fringed silk Persian rugs, Persian rugs. On a tiny satin wood table stood a statuette by Clodian and beside it lay a copy of Les Cent Novelles, bound for Marguerite of Valois by Clovis Eve, and powdered with the gilt daisies, said the queen, that the queen had selected for her device. 
Some large blue china jars filled with parrot tulips were arranged on the mantel shelf, and through the small leaded panes of the windows streamed the apricot colored light of a summer's day in London. Lord Henry had not come in yet. He was always late on principle, his principle being that punctuality is the thief of time. So the lad was looking rather sulky. As, was listle, as his listless fingers, he turned over the pages of an elaborately illustrated edition of Man in Lescoth that he had found in one of the bookcases. The formal monotonous ticking of the Louis Quartor's clock annoyed him. Once or twice, he thought of going away. At last, he heard a step outside, and the door opened. How late you are, Harry, he murmured. I am afraid it is not Harry, Mr. Gray, said a woman's voice. He glanced quickly round and rose to his feet. I beg your pardon. I thought you thought it was my husband. It is only his wife. You must let me introduce myself. I know you quite well by your photographs. I think my husband has got 27 of them. Not 27, Lady Henry. Well, 26 then. I saw you with him the other night at the opera. She laughed nervously as she spoke and watched him with her vague forget-me-not eyes. She was a curious woman whose dresses always looked as if they had been designed in a rage and put on in a tempest. She was always in love with somebody, and as her passion was never returned, she had kept all her illusions. She tried to look picturesque, but only succeeded in being untidy. Her name was Victoria, and she had a perfect mania for going to church. That was at La Hogren, Lady Henry, I think. Yes, it was at Dear La Hogren. I was, it was, I like Wagner's music better than any other music. It was so loud that one could talk the whole time without people hearing what one says. That is a great advantage, don't you think so, Mr. Gray? The same nervous staccato broke from her thin lips and her fingers began to play with a long paper knife. Dorian smiled and shook his head. I am afraid I don't think so, Lady Henry. I never talk during music, at least during good music. If one hears bad music, it is one's duty to drown it out by conversation. Ah, that is one of Henry's views, isn't it, Mr. Gray? But you must not think I don't like good music. I adore it, but I'm afraid of it. It makes me too romantic. I have simply worshipped pianists, two at a time sometimes. I don't know what it is about them. Perhaps it is that they're foreigners. They are all, aren't they? Even those who are born in England become foreigners after a time, don't they? It is so clever of them and such a compliment to art. Makes it quite cosmopolitan, doesn't it? You never have been to any of my parties, have you, Mr. Gray? You must come. I can't afford orchids, but I spare no expense in foreigners. They make one's room look so picturesque. But here it is, here is Harry. Harry, come, I came to look for you to ask you something. I forget what it was, and I found Mr. Gray here. We have had such a pleasant chat about music. We have quite the same views. No, I think our views are quite different, but he has been most pleasant. I am so glad I have seen him. I am charmed, my love, quite charmed, said Lord Henry, elevating his dark crescent-shaped eyebrows and looking at them both with an amused smile. So sorry I am late, Dorian. I went to look after a piece of old brocade on Wardour Street and had to bargain for hours for it. Nowadays, people know the price of everything and the value of nothing. I am afraid I must be going, exclaimed Lady Henry, after an awkward silence with her silly, sudden laugh. I have promised to drive with the Duchess. Goodbye, Mr. Gray. Goodbye, Harry. You are dining out, I suppose? So am I. Perhaps I will sh see you at Lord Thornberry's. Lady Thornberry's. I dare say, my dear, said Lord Henry, shutting the door behind her as she flitted out of the room looking like a bird of paradise that had been out in the rain and leaving a faint order of patchouli, odor of patchouli behind her. Then he shook hands with Dorian Gray, lit a cigarette, and flung himself down on the sofa. Never marry a woman with straw-colored hair, Dorian, he said after a few puffs. Why, Harry? Because they are so sentimental. But I like sentimental people. Never marry at all, Dorian. Men marry because they are tired. Women, because they are curious. Both are disappointed. I don't think I am likely to marry Harry. I am too much in love. That is one of your aphorisms. I am putting it into practice as I do everything you say. 
Whom are you in love with? asked Lord Henry, looking at him with a curious smile. With an actress, said Dorian Gray, blushing. Lord Henry shrugged his shoulders. That is a rather commonplace debut, he murmured. You would not say so if you saw her, Harry. Who is she? Her name is Sybil Vane. Never heard of her. No one has. People someday, however, will. She is a genius. My dear boy, no woman is a genius. Women are a decorative sex. They never have anything to say, but they say it charmingly. They represent the triumph of matter over mind. Just as men, we represent the triumph of mind over morals. There are only two kinds of women, the plain and the colored. The plain women are very useful. If you want to gain a reputation for respectability, you have merely to take them down to supper. The other women are very charming. They commit one mistake, however. They paint in order to try to look young. Our grandmothers painted in order to talk, try to talk brilliantly. Rouge and Esprit used to go together. That is all gone out, has all gone out now. As long as a woman can look 10 years younger than her own daughter, she is perfectly satisfied. As for conversation, there are only five women in London worth talking to, and two of these can't be admitted into decent society. However, tell me about your genius. How long have you known her? About three weeks. Not so much. About two weeks and two days. How did you come across her? I will tell you, Harry, but you mustn't be unsympathetic about it. After all, it never would have happened if I had not met you. You filled me with a wild desire desire to know everything about life. Four days after I met you, something seemed to throb in my veins. As I lounged in the park or strolled down Piccadilly, I used to look at everyone who passed me and wonder with a mad curiosity what sort of lives they led. Some of them had fascinated me, others filled me with terror. There was an exquisite poison in the air. I had a passion for sensations. One evening about seven o'clock, I determined to go out in search of some adventure. I felt this gray, monstrous London of ours, with its myriads of people, its splendid sinners, and all its sordid sins, as you once said, must have something in store for me. I fancied a thousand things. The mere danger gave me a sense of delight. I remembered what you had said to me on that wonderful night when we first dined together about the search for beauty being the poisonous secret of life. I don't know what I expected, but I went out and wandered eastward, soon losing my way in a labyrinth of grimy streets and black grassless squares. About half past eight, I passed by a third, a little third-rate theater with a great flaring, with great flaring gas jets and gaudy playbills. A hideous Jew in the most amazing waistcoat I ever beheld in my life was standing at the entrance, <clears throat> smoking a vile cigar. He had greasy ringlets and an enormous diamond blazoned in the center of a soiled shirt. Have a box, my lord, he said when he saw me, and he took off his hat with an act of gorgeous servility. There was something about him, Harry, that amused me. He was such a monster. You will laugh at me, I know, but I really went in and paid a whole guinea for the stage box. To the present day, I can't make out why I did so, Yet if I haven't, my dear, yet if I hadn't, my dear Henry, if I hadn't, I would have missed the greatest romance of my life. I see you are laughing. Is it horrid of you? I am not laughing, Dorian. At least I am not laughing at you. But you should not say the greatest romance of your life. You should say the first romance of your life. You will always be loved, and you will always be in love with love. There are exquisite things in store for you. This is merely the beginning. Do you think my nature so shallow? cried Dorian Gray ang angrily. No, I think your nature so deep. How do you mean? My dear boy, people who only love once in their lives are really shallow people. What they call their loyalty and their fidelity, I call either the lethargy of custom or the lack of imagination. Faithlessness is to the emotional life what consistency is to the inte intellectual life, simply a confession of failure. But I don't want to interrupt you. Go on with your story. Well, I found myself seated in a horrid little private box with a vulgar drop scene staring me in the face. I looked up behind the curtain and surveyed the house. It was a tawdry affair, all cupids and cornucopias, like a third-rate wedding cake. 
The gallery and the pit were fairly full, but the two rows of dingy stalls were quite empty, and there was hardly a person in what I suppose they called the dress circle. Women went about with oranges and ginger beer, and there was a terrible consumption of nuts going on. It must have been just like the palmy days of the British drama. Just like I should fancy and very horrid. I began to wonder what on earth should I do when I caught sight of the playbill, and what do you think the play was, Harry? I should think the idiot boy or dumb but innocent. Our fathers used to like that sort of piece, I believe. The longer I live, Dorian, the more keenly I feel that whatever was good enough for our fathers is not good enough for us. In art, as in politics, les grand fears ont toujours sorts. The play was good enough for us, Harry. It was Romeo and Juliet. I must admit, I was rather annoyed at the idea of seeing Shakespeare done in such a wretched hole of a place. Still, I felt interested in a sort of way. At any rate, I was determined to wait for the first act. There was a dreadful orchestra presided over by a young Jew who sat at a cracked piano that nearly drove me away, but at last the drop scene was drawn up and the play began. Romeo was a stout elderly gentleman with corked eyebrows and a husky tragedy voice with a figure like a barrel, a beer barrel. Mercutio was almost as bad. He was played by the low comedian who had introduced gags of his own and was on most familiar terms with the pit. They were as grotesque as the scenery and that looked as if it had come out like a pantomime of 50 years ago. But Juliet, Harry, imagine a girl hardly 17 of years of age with a little flower-like face, a small Greek heated plated coils of dark brown hair and eyes that were violet wells of passion lips that were like petals of rose. She was the loveliest thing I had seen in my life. You said to me once that pathos left you unmoved, but that beauty, mere beauty, could fill your eyes with tears. I tell you, Harry, I could hardly see this girl for the mist of tears that came across to me, and her voice. I never heard such a voice. It was low at first, with deep mellow notes that seemed to fall singly upon one's ear. Then it became a little louder and sounded like a flute or a distant hot voice. In the garden scene, it had all the tremulous ecstasy that one hears just before dawn when nightingales are singing. There were moments later on when it had the wild passion of violins. You know how a voice can stir one. Your voice and the voice of Sybil Vane are two things that I shall never forget. When I close my eyes, I hear them and each of them says something different. I don't know which to follow. Should I, why should I not love her, Harry? I do love her. She is everything to me in life. Night after night, I go see her play. One evening, she is Rosalind, and the next e evening, she is Imogen. I have seen her die in the gloom of an Italian tomb, sucking the poison from her lover's lips. I have watched her wandering through the forest of Arden, disguised as a pretty boy in hose and doublet and dainty cap. She has been mad and has come to the, into the presence of a guilty king and given him rue to wear and bitter herbs to taste of. She has been innocent and black hands of jealousy have crushed her reed-like throat. I have seen her in every age and in every costume. Ordinary women never appeal to one's imagination. They are limited to their century. No glamour ever transfigures them. One knows their minds as easily as one knows their bonnets. One can always find them. There is no mystery in one of them. They ride in the park in the morning and chatter at tea parties in the afternoon. They have stereotyped smile and their fashionable manner. They are quite obvious, but an actress, how different an actress is. Why don't you tell me that the only thing worth loving is an actress? Because I have loved so many of them, Dorian. Oh yes, horrid people have dyed with dyed hair and painted faces. Don't run down dyed hair and painted faces. There is, there is an extraordinary charm in them sometimes. I wish now I had not told you about Sybil Vane. You could not have helped telling me, Dorian. All through your life you will tell me everything you do. Yes, Harry, I believe that is true. I cannot help telling you things. You have a curious influence over me. And if I ever did a crime, I would come and confide it to you. You would understand me. 
People like you, the willful sunbeams of life, do not commit crimes, Dorian, but I am much obliged for the compliment all the same. And tell me, reach me the matches like a good boy. Thanks. Tell me, what are your relations with Sybil Vane? Dorian Gray leaped to his feet with flushed cheeks and burning eyes. Harry, Sybil Vane is sacred. It is only the sacred things that are worth touching, Dorian, said Lord Henry with a strange touch of pathos in his voice. Why should you be annoyed? I suppose she will be yours some day. When one is in love, one always begins by deceiving oneself, and one always ends by deceiving others. That is what the world calls romance. You should hear, at any rate, I suppose. You know her, at any rate, I suppose. Of course I know her. On the first night I was in the theater, that horrid Jew came round to the box after the performance was over and offered to bring me behind the scenes and introduce me to her. I was furious with him and told him that Juliet had been dead for hundreds of years and that her body was lying in a marble tomb in Verona. I think from his blank look of amazement that he thought I had taken too much champagne or something. I am not surprised. I was not surprised either. Then he asked me if I wrote for any of the newspapers. I told him I never even read them. He seemed terribly disappointed at that and confided to me that all the dramatic critics were in conspiracy against him and that they were all to be bought. I believe he was quite right there, but on the other hand, most of them are not at all expensive. Well, he seemed to think they were beyond his means. By the time the lights were being put out in the theater and I had to go, he wanted me to try some cigars, which he strongly recommended. I declined. The next night, I, of course, I arrived at the theater again. When he saw me, he made me a low bow, and I assured him when he saw me, he made me a low bow and assured me that I was a patron of art. He was most a most offensive brute, though he had an extraordinary passion for Shakespeare. He told me once with an air of pride that his three bankruptcies were entirely due to the poet, whom he insisted on calling the bard. He seemed to think it was a distinction. It was a distinction, my dear Dorian, a great distinction. But when did you first speak to Miss Sybil Vane? The third night. She had been playing Rosalind. I could not help going around. I had thrown her some flowers, and she looked at me. At least I fancied that she had. The old Jew was persistent. He seemed determined to bring me behind, so I consented. It was curious my not wanting to know her, wasn't it? No, I don't think so. My dear Harry, why? I will tell you some other time. Now I want to know about the girl. Thank you.